and welcome back to Statistics 479 Time Series Analysis. Today we're going to be doing, well, the same thing we've been doing for the AR process, but we're going to be doing it for the ARMA process. I'm talking about estimation, forecasting, it's going to be a pretty good lecture. So when dealing with the ARMA process, we're going to be using the same types of tools that we were doing for the AR process. Specifically, we're going to be using maximum likelihood. Now, maximum likelihood is a good friend of ours, but it's going to require a strong assumption. And that assumption is that our white noise is Gaussian, not a unreasonable assumption, but it's something to take into account nevertheless. Now, going forward, we're going to find that the equations are quite messy. Um, so we're not going to go into them in excruciating detail. I'm going to try to spare you some of the nitty gritty details and we're going to try to focus on the big picture, what's going on, because ultimately there's going to be a function in R that's going to fit these models for you. But it's good to know what they're actually doing, what these functions that is are actually doing when you try to plug your own data in. And that's what we'll be talking about in this lecture. And we're here again with another lecture of statistics for 79 time series analysis. Today we're going to do, in some sense, exactly what we did before. But before, well, what did we do? We looked at estimation and forecasting for the AR process, the autoregressive process. Today what we're going to do is do the same thing, but for the ARMA process. So now we're going to include an MA piece in our model. It's going to complicate things a little bit, but ultimately the main ideas are still going to be the same. We don't have access to the Yule Walker equations because of the MA piece, but what we do have is we still have our good friend maximum likelihood, which we can work with, assuming, of course, that the white noise process is Gaussian. If the white noise is not Gaussian, the ARMA process is not Gaussian, and then we can't use maximum likelihood. Luckily, most things are Gaussian, so we're kind of okay as long as we're just aware of the fact that if we have a process whose noise looks very skewed in one direction, um, very heavy tailed, uh, very strange behavior like that, then we have to be a little bit careful when we use one of these methods to fit, um, fit an ARMA model to our data. And this is really the same thing that you would do in linear regression, right? I mean, linear regression as we would teach it um, at the undergrad level has a lot of very strict requirements. If your data doesn't fit those requirements, you have to be a little bit more careful and try maybe more sophisticated methods. But at least for today, we're going to assume that all noise is Gaussian and we're going to start to estimate some parameters for an ARMA process. So how do we do that? Well, let's go check out the notes and see. All right, so the first topic of today's lecture is going to be estimation for ARMA PQ. So again, the idea that we're going to do is we're going to specify a P, specify a Q, and then try to estimate the parameters, phi, one through P, um, theta, one through Q, um, the mean, the variance. In fact, I'll just write it all down, right? What we're trying to get is we want to be able to estimate the mean, mu, the variant, sigma squared, the autoregressive parameters, phi 1 through phi p, and the moving average parameters, theta 1 through theta q. So we actually have a lot of parameters that we have to worry about fitting. Um, even if p and q are not too big, there's still a lot of different things we have to estimate. And as I mentioned, what we're going to do is we're going to do this via maximum likelihood. So ultimately, we want to do the same thing we did with maximum likelihood in the case of the um, autoregressive process. Um, so if we take a maximum likelihood approach to estimation, what we really just want to do is write down the likelihood of mu of theta or of sigma squared of the phi's, which I'm just going to write phi because I don't really want to write lots of phi's, and the same with theta. So we want to write down the likelihood. Now, the joint likelihood is going to be a big multivariate Gaussian distribution. I don't know what that is. 
So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use the same type of conditioning argument that we did in the autoregressive section of estimation. Um, that is, what we're going to do is instead of writing the joint density function, we're going to write a product t from 1 to capital T of f x t conditioned on all of the previous measurements. Now this is basically, this is conditioning on all past observations. So in the AR case, we only had to condition back as far as the order of the process. If we had an ARP process, we only had to go P time units back. But we have an MA process now, or we have an ARMA, but we have an MA piece. And the MA piece is going to require us to condition all the way back through time, all the way back to X1. So we have a little bit of a more complicated um, conditioning here, but we're still going to, we're still allowed to decompose our joint density into the product of conditional densities. And that's what we're doing here. And all of these densities F are going to be Gaussian. All right, so another thing is um, assume, as always, xt is, um, I guess, causal and invertible. for the AR and the MA piece respectively. As I mentioned in the previous lectures when we looked at these things, uh, there are equivalent processes that will be non-causal or non-invertible and will give you the same behavior stochastically. You'll get the same looking data out, which is kind of a weird thing to think about. But this non-uniqueness issue is why we want to enforce that what we're estimating is going to be something that is causal and invertible so that we're only estimating one thing. We're not trying, we don't have data that could be represented by two distinct models. We have data and it's going to be one specific model that we are going to estimate from it. So that's an important thing in statistics. The idea of identifiability does show up a lot um, in statistics. Uh, so given this, right, we can write um, xt as an infinite linear process. So I need a sum in there or else it's not going to be infinite. i equals zero to infinity of phi i w t minus i. Right, where phi i are going to be some coefficients depending on, oh sorry, psi, the pitchfork one is a psi. Okay, so this is psi i from 1 to infinity where the psi's are going to depend on the phi's and the thetas to keep my Greek in line. Anyway, um, yeah, so we're, we can write it that way. We can write it in this, uh, in this infinite, um, in this infinite linear process, causal linear process form. And Furthermore, what we have is that for the random variable, so this is kind of weird, but I'm going to write the random variable xt given xt minus 1 through x1. So this is a univariate random variable. I'm taking xt, I'm conditioning it on the past measurements. It's still going to be a random variable. Um, so this thing is going to be have a normal distribution, Gaussian distribution. Um, the mean, yes. So the with, I'll just write it on the next line. With mean being the prediction, the pre, um, the one step ahead prediction, which we denote as x hat t minus one and t. So this is again, this is the prediction. This is, no, oh, I didn't change my color. There we go. This is the prediction of xt from 
x t minus one through x one. So all it's really saying is that the mean value is going to be of our random variable is what we would predict it to be, right? Um, and what's the variance? Well, the variance. we'll say with variance and the variance in this case is going to be well we can just write it down um, it's the expected value of the random variable xt here minus x hat t t minus one squared and this thing is the mean squared prediction error so the variance of this random variable is coincides with the mean squared prediction error, um, which we denoted in the previous lecture as P with a T in the subscript and a T minus one in the superscript saying that it's the mean squared prediction error for predicting time point T based on all of the previous time points T minus one and into the past. Now, this is good because it means that if we have a Gaussian distribution and if we know what the mean is and we know what the variance is, we know the entire distribution. So what that means, yeah, well, what that means, therefore, um, the likelihood, which I'm just gonna write as L right now because I don't really feel like writing all the parameters in there. So the likelihood, which was just to indicate up here, star, red star, there it is. Um, so the likelihood, right, is just going to be the product now, T from one to capital T of, well, what's it gonna be? It's going to be, um, let's see if we can do this with the normal distribution. It's going to be two pi times the variance, which is yeah, the mean squared prediction error T t minus one, this is all to the minus one half. And then there's gonna be an expo exponential. And the exponential is going to be something like one over two times the variance, p t t minus one. Um, and then we're going to have to have x, I guess. Yeah, I guess I need a, a, a variable. So we'll just say x or something, or no, I guess it's x t x t minus its mean, which is x hat uh, t minus one t squared. So that's what our likelihood is going to be. And the problem is we need to figure out, well, wait, what is the mean squared prediction error? Right, we want to eventually, the point is eventually what we want to do is we want to plug in um, all the values we get, all the, all the things we have here so that the likelihood is in terms of all of our parameters, mu, sigma squared, phi, and theta. And the idea is that then we can do what we normally do, which is take a log, take a derivative, find the... Um, maximum likelihood estimator by, well, maximizing the likelihood, um, right? Finding the estimator that maximizes the likelihood to just say the same thing in a different order. Um, so to do that, what we have to do is get the likelihood into a form that we can start taking derivatives of, partial derivatives of to get what's going on here. So for the mean squared prediction error, well, we can start with the case where T is equal to one. And in that case, we would have a P one zero, which we're just gonna call the variance of, um, I guess the variance, yeah, for the process, the variance of XT. It's stationary, so the variance, uh, maybe XT is a little confusing because I said T is equal to one. It's stationary, so the variance will be the same for all time points. I just need to write something there. Um, so I could write x1, right, if I really wanted to. It's, you know, this is equal to the variance of x1, et cetera. Um, but what we can do is we can use this form of a causal linear process up above to note that since white noise is uncorrelated, 
and well actually in this case it's gaussian so it's independent white noise because it's gaussian white noise um furthermore the psi coefficients have to decrease fast enough to make that thing absolutely convergent um so what that means is that i can write this out basically i can flip the variance and the summation and i get something that's going to look like sigma squared from the uh when i take the um the variance of those terms the w's um the white noise and i'm going to get a bunch of psi i squared so i can write down at least in this case what it would be and psi is going to end up being a um, related to my parameters phi and theta so then the question is well what happens when t is uh, greater than one well from last lecture t greater than one we can use what we learned about from Durbin Levinson in the past lecture which if you recall from the past lecture was something like ah pt plus one t is going to equal to the previous guy p t minus one t times some updating basically times some um, alpha coefficient something that looked like this now as i kind of point out in my written notes i'm not so concerned about the precise computation because all this stuff is going to be kind of pushed under the rug in a second but the idea that i want is uh that you intuitively understand what's going on here not that you can go through and get out every nitty gritty detail and partial derivative because it's just not worth it to go through all of the individual details it's kind of tedious and boring and i don't think you really learn anything from it um but what i want to do is i want to give you the intuition about what we're actually doing here and how this pro uh, how this is all coming together so the idea is that we can write p t minus 1 t which again is the mean squared prediction error it's the variance uh, for our normal distribution and what we're going to do is we're going to write it as something that's going to look like sigma squared times rt now okay we could figure out what rt is but i don't really want to the point is that um rt does not depend on sigma squared so is that clear the idea is that we start with our first mean squared prediction error just being the variant which is sigma squared times something else then when we update it using durbin levinson we just keep multiplying by some alpha which is in terms of things that do not depend on sigma squared so ultimately we're going to have sigma squared times something and that something is not going to depend on sigma squared um that's going to matter because therefore we get our likelihood once again which i'm going to put that little red star to indicate that once again we're back to writing down the likelihood and every time we write it it gets a little bit more intelligible um so in this case what we're going to get well actually we don't need that product because i'm going to take the product over everything so inside the first thing in the product is a two pi and our um, variance term or our mean squared prediction error term so we're going to have a two pi two pi is going to be multiplied by itself t times or i should say two pi to the minus one half and there's also going to be a sigma squared in there that's coming from the p so what we end up with the first thing we get is a two pi sigma squared and that's going to be to the minus capital t over two because i multiplied t of them capital t of them together so the other thing we're going to get are going to be these rt's which i can keep as a term unto themselves and that's going to look like t from one to capital t r t the minus one half 
Yeah, because in this case, every RT is going to be different. We're just taking the product of all of them, but there still is a power of minus one half um, from the Gaussian distribution. And then what we're left over with is something in the exponent, and that something in the exponent is going to be minus, and I'm going to write it as notation S mu phi theta divided by two sigma squared. So if you recall from when we did estimation for the AR process with maximum likelihood, we had this S term in the exponent. That was the conditional or the unconditional sum of squares, depending on which part of the lecture you're referring to. Um, in this case, where in this case, what we're going to have is that S of mu phi theta. Again, there's no sigma squared dependency here, um, which is going to be important when we start taking derivatives. Um, so this is going to be the sum t from one to capital T of, well, this guy, xt minus x hat, x hat, um, xt minus x hat, t minus one t. Um, but there's one more thing in the denominator, which is that rt term, which is a little mysterious because I don't want to write it down because it's just a big mess of terms. It's not really pleasant to deal with, but the point is that it's still there. Um, and this is what we have, some sort of sum of squares. Ah, I forgot the square. It's not a sum of squares if you don't square it. There we go. Words to live by. Anyway, now what we have is we have some type of sum of squares equation. And if we do the calculus that we've done multiple times already, then we can say dot, 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 via calculus, we get that the estimate, the maximum likelihood estimate for the um, variance for sigma, or the sigma squared, which is the variance of the white noise process. Remember, the variance of xt is up here. It's sigma squared times something else. But the sigma squared is the variance of the Gaussian white noise that is underlying, is sort of, you know, um, driving the, uh, the time series, the ARMA process that we're working with. Now, yes, where were we doing? We were writing down the estimator and we're going to get what we normally get whenever we try to estimate the variance of a Gaussian distribution using maximum likelihood. And what we're going to get is we're going to get the sum of squares where we fill in the parameters with hats and we divide by n, right? This is more or less, it's a little bit maybe less clear in this case, but it's the same thing that you get every time you try to take the derivative of, or you try to find the maximum likelihood estimator for the variance of a Gaussian distribution. Sum of something squared divided by n. Um, sometimes we end up, you know, subtracting one or more or two or p from n based on the number of parameters, but that's not the maximum likelihood estimator, that's the unbiased estimator. So. In this case, we're just doing maximum likelihood. All right, so now what we would need to do is we would need to figure out what mu hat, phi, the phi hat, remember phi hat and theta hat are just placeholders for phi one through phi p, theta one through theta p. So they're actually kind of vectors of parameters. Um, so basically, yeah, now what we need to do is Ah, uh, yeah, that's right. Maximize the concentrated likelihood is a new term. So then we get something called the concentrated likelihood. Okay, so what is that? Well, what that's going to be is that we basically, we replace sigma squared above by 
s of mu phi theta over n um because we kind of again this is one of those goofy things in math right it's like we we know that there's a sigma squared hat and it exists and it's a thing and it depends on other parameters i don't know what it is yet but i can still work with it in the likelihood equation and the neat thing is that if i plug that in then um well things become a little bit simpler so we're going to write down the likelihood for the <laughs> dot 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 therefore star likelihood equation we're going to write it down another time and now we're going to get a two pi our sigma squared here is going to be s mu phi theta um, there's going to be a divided by n here so let's increase the size of these parentheses and then take it to the minus t over 2 power um, there's still going to be this rt thing here which yeah it's kind of annoying but it's just there minus one half uh, then the interesting thing is what happens in the exponent um, because in the exponent what we'd be getting is we take our s mu phi theta and divide it by s of mu phi theta so the whole thing cancels out and we're left with just an n over 2. so this is i guess not really l it's the likelihood it's the concentrated likelihood we basically say okay we have an idea of what sigma squared should be so we're just going to plug it in and push forward and by doing that now we're going to take the derivative the partial derivative of this thing with respect to mu and phi and sigma squared in order to well find the um the estimators that is the um we can solve for them the maximum likelihood estimators for everything else so this means that we're going to get a log that's not a very good log a the we can do this log likelihood and the log likelihood in this case is going to be some coefficient c which is all the junk of depending on n and 2 pi that i just don't care about um and then we're going to have the stuff that we do care about which is minus t over 2 um times the log of hmm well here ah except i'm doing one silly thing i switched uh i switched uh the sample size because right in statistics very often we treat the sample size is denoted as lowercase n in this case our sample size is actually capital t so i mean everywhere i think i just started doing it down in the likelihood equation yeah down here so this guy should actually be a uh, capital t just it's the same thing right i'm dividing by the total sample size but to be precise the total sample size in time series world is capital t so this should also be a, a capital t and this guy here should be a capital t okay so yeah besides that um we're all good um and then what we're going to get is we're going to get the log of s mu phi theta divided by capital t and to go back and make that uh, more clear in my notes um and then we're going to take the derivative of this guy well not the derivative sorry the log and we're going to have a minus one half times the sum all right so where were we well what we're going to do is we need to write down t from one to capital t of the log of r t and this is going to be our um, log likelihood which we can then take derivatives of and try to estimate the parameters or i guess solve in some um, numeric sense on a computer 
So, okay, I don't particularly want to do that <laughs> because it would require us to write down all of these terrible terms. Um, what I really want you to take away from this is just the intuition about what we're doing. So let me finish this um, statement and just say, then we can solve for mu hat, phi hat, and theta hat, given all of these terms. I just want you to go through the thought process of what we did right what we did was we said okay we have xt it has a normal distribution because we're assuming it's gaussian process i don't want to write down the joint density so i write down the the joint density as a product of conditional densities right i know what the mean and the variance are in terms of the um one step ahead prediction predictor um and the one step ahead mean squared prediction error so then what I have is my giant likelihood equation. Ah, what I need to do is plug in something for P. After I plug in something for P, now I know I can, I can get that, right? If I plug everything into the alg an algorithm, I can access all of the P's. It's just that in an equation sense, it's going to be really messy to write down. Then what I do is I come down here and I get my likelihood in a nice form where I have my sigma squared, the variance of the white noise separated from all the other parameters. As often happens with a Gaussian distribution, I can get the estimator for sigma hat squared. And then the new trick, which might be something new, I mean, all of this so far is stuff that you would see if you just did maximum likelihood estimation for the normal distribution, the univariate normal in like stats 101 class um it's just the the notation is a little bit more terrible but what's interesting then is this idea of concentrated likelihood where you then plug this guy back into the likelihood to simplify the exponent and give yourself something to work with and then from there we just i guess brute force our way through and can get all of the parameters Luckily, there are R packages that will just calculate this for you, but it's really good to know the thought process that goes into where these estimators are coming from and how they come about. And furthermore, what I think is more interesting to focus on is also the asymptotic properties of the estimators because right in stats, we estimate things. The things we estimate very often are going to be asymptotically normal. It's kind of a like constant theme in all of statistics. Okay, I have data. I estimate a parameter. What's that parameter? Eh, it's normal enough. Um, and sure enough, we get asymptotic normality in this case. So um, the next little section is going to be asymptotic normality and this is important because asymptotic normality means that if our data size is large enough our estimator should look normal if we know what the mean and the variance should be then we can do hypothesis tests and we can say okay is this parameter significantly different from zero that is is this actually a significant parameter in my model or not um, we can do confidence intervals we can say okay here's the ar parameter or the ma parameter that i computed but, you know, where do I think the true parameter lies? Boom, you know, 95% confidence interval brought to you by asymptotic normality. Um, though I've always been a more fan of the uh, non-asymptotic approaches to statistics, but they're less uh, popular, I guess, just because they're kind of newer. Um, well, more or less. Anyway, before I get off on a side tangent, um, let's denote... denote beta to be a big parameter vector of phi's, phi one through phi p, and yes, theta one through theta p, or q, theta q. And we're gonna denote, I'm gonna write this in a different color, that if I put a hat on beta, I'm just putting a hat on all of the elements inside the vector. So we're gonna have beta, which is the vector of true parameters, 
we're frequentist statistics at the moment. So we have true parameters for the model. Um, and then we have beta hat. Beta hat is the vector of estimators for all of those parameters. So what are we getting? Well, we get, to note this, um, where, ah, say where the hats indicate MLEs, maximum likelihood estimators, um, then that is the stuff that we would have gotten from up here um, if we solved all these, I guess, derivatives or optimized the, uh, maximized the likelihood with respect to all the parameters. Right, so then what we get is that the square root of t, the sample size, times beta hat minus beta, which is the difference of the two vectors, converges in distribution to a normal zero sigma squared um, random variable with matrix gamma p q. I'll write that down in a second. Um, this is as capital T goes to infinity. So another reason why I say in the project component of your course, I'd like you to make sure that the data size you have is big enough. Um, you know, don't come with like a time series that has 15 observations because we really want T to get big uh, in order so that we can trust all of these estimators or at least the normal approximation, the normal um, the asymptotic normality of these estimators, right? We're never asymptotic. We're never, we never have infinite data, um, but we have enough that we say, eh, we're close enough to being infinite or asymptotic, I guess. I've never really liked that argument, but uh, it is sort of standard practice and it does actually work in practice. So <laughs> you can't fault it too much. Um, anyway, uh, I didn't tell you what that matrix gamma is. So, the first point is that we have asymptotic normality. Hooray, we have an, um, an asymptotic normal distribution um, where gamma PQ is going to be, well, I'm not gonna tell you exactly what it is yet. I'm just gonna go one step further down the rabbit hole and tell you that this matrix is a block matrix in terms of what we'll call gamma phi phi gamma phi theta, gamma theta phi, gamma theta theta. I wonder if there are any like frats or sororities that are gamma theta phi. <laughs> if they are, they uh, must be into time series. So going forward, uh, what are these matrices now? Um, I'll say another where, iterative where's here, where, um, I'm going to say gamma phi phi ij. The ijth entry of that matrix is going to equal the auto covariance of y. I didn't tell you what y is yet, but I will in a second. i minus j, where um, capital phi b of y t is equal to wt. That is y t is the a r piece of x t. So, okay, and we haven't told you what the other gamma matrices are yet, but let's stare at this for a second. What we're saying is the matrix gamma the phi matrix gamma is going to be a matrix of auto covariances. Again, as I mentioned, auto covariance is basically this entire course. Um, and the auto covariances are not for X, they're for Y. And what is Y? Y is the process is basically XT if we just deleted the um, moving average piece, right? Um, I should point out here that we had, I didn't actually write this down at the beginning, but we would have something like this. Um, 
theta b w t. Here, I'm, I guess I'm saying we'll say mean zero, so I don't have to put in a mean term um, and worry about messing that up. But that's what we have, right? We have our ARMA PQ process has two pieces to it. It has an autoregressive piece and a moving average piece. In this case, we're just looking at the autoregressive piece for that matrix. And as you might guess, for the other matrices, we're going to look at the, um, um, well, for the other matrix, gamma phi theta, no, gamma theta theta, ij, the ijth entry of that is going to be denoted as k of y prime ij. So, okay, well, what's that? Well, where, we just have where's all across the board here, y prime t is going to be the moving average operator applied to wt. So this is the ma piece of xt. So that's what we're kind of doing here. And then I guess the last thing we need to figure out is what are those um, off diagonal block matrices um, I guess we'll say that gamma phi theta ij is the cross covariance between y and y prime i minus j and likewise the reverse of that theta phi. It's symmetric so you can just transpose it but um, you can also write this as y prime y i minus j, even though they're the same thing, um, <laughs> right? Um, no, I have to transpose it together to work because it's going to be a p by q or q by p matrix. So besides the transpose, they're basically the same thing. Um, right, so that's the result. I think somewhere possibly in the textbook there's a nasty long proof of it, which we're not going to do in this course um, because I'd rather just spend the time explaining the concepts and then doing some examples in R. Um, though at this rate, we might be doing the examples in R probably in the next lecture uh, once we talk about forecasting a bit in the latter half of today, today's lecture. But before we're done with this section on asymptotics, Let's do a simple example, or two simple examples. So example one, which is the AR1 process, which is of course just xt is going to be phi xt minus one plus wt. And with the auto, well, the variance, the auto covariance at lag zero from many lectures ago, it always seems to pop up. It's going to be this thing. It's sigma squared, the variance of the white noise divided by one minus phi squared. Um, so therefore, the point is that this gamma matrix above um, this guy here in green is going to be pretty simple because it's a one zero. So it's not even a matrix, it's just one single value. And what's that value? It's um, just, uh, I feel like I need to, oh yeah, I would, I think we need to divide all of these by sigma squared because we don't want the sigma squared being in here twice. See, I have a, make sure I'm not messing something up. I have my sigma squared in there. Um, so I don't want a sigma squared to pop out of here. So in some sense, I guess I would need to divide all of these things by sigma squared so that I don't have two sigma squareds in my, um, um, in my matrix. The point is, is that what I want here for this guy is just um, the 
one minus phi squared to the you know to the minus one, but I don't want that sigma squared floating around. Therefore, what we get is we get that our estimator phi hat is going to converge. Let me double check this. Yes. Our um, estimator is going to converge in distribution to phi with if we, well, I'll just write it out and then we'll talk about it. I think we need a sigma squared in here. And a 1 minus phi squared. Yeah, that looks better. I think I forgot the sigma squared in my uh, typed up notes for this lecture. So what we're saying is, is that, okay, this is good, right? We have our estimator here, and it's going to converge in distribution to the right, the thing we want, um, which is phi. And we have a um, variance which goes to zero as t goes to infinity um, as we get more data. So the variance is also going to depend on 1 minus phi squared, which is quite interesting because that means if phi is really close to 1, remember it can't be 1 or else we have a random walk, it's not stationary, everything falls apart. But if it's close to 1, then it's going to shrink the variance by some constant. So the variance in some sense will be smaller as phi gets closer to 1, which is quite interesting. Um, whereas the, in some sense, the worst case scenario for the variance would be if phi is equal to zero, then the variance is just that of white noise, right? So that's another interesting thing to point out because I was kind of mentioning this with the mean squared prediction error in the previous lecture that I said, okay, the worst possible prediction error is just the variance of the white noise. And then if you're lucky, you can gain some information from previous observations and the prediction error will go down. Well, in this case, right, what we basically have is the, um, we have two pieces here for the variance. We have um, a sigma squared and we have a one minus phi squared. And when we look at these two things, we have the variance of WT and this is the influence from the AR, I guess, one <laughs> process. So it is kind of nice to look at these formula and kind of see what's going on here. So by symmetry, we actually get, well, I'm going to do another example. Um, and by symmetry, it's actually just going to be the exact same thing. But we're going to write it out anyway, just to make sure it's clear. In this case, we're going to have our MA process, which is going to be theta, WT minus 1 plus WT. For theta, less than 1, so it's invertible, etc. Um, so what's going to happen here, and this is kind of funny, is that, uh, well, first, the MA polynomial is what it's going to be uh, 1 minus theta, not 1 minus 1 plus theta b. Oh, that is not how you write a polynomial. Theta of b is equal to 1 plus theta b. And that's kind of neat because well, what we're ultimately going to do is then try to um, basically look at this as an AR process. So therefore, the, well, the AR1 model theta B applied to some time series Y equal to WT um, has 
the same behavior as above, which means that we're going to get the exact same thing out, which in this case is just going to be, well, the same thing we had before, but I'm going to replace the, um, the phi's with a bunch of thetas. Ah, that needs to be a theta squared. Cool. So that's a kind of a little weird, tricky thing, but it's basically saying that, um, yeah, we get the same behavior um, in both cases of our estimators, at least for the AR1 and the MA1. And we see the same thing, which is the closer our parameter is to zero, theta or phi, the closer our process is to white noise. Uh, the, if theta or phi tend towards one, I guess minus one as well, but let's say they tend towards one, um, we start to move towards the, well, the random walk in the one case or in the moving average case, I'd guess we'd be on this weird cusp between invertible and non-invertible. Um, yeah, I actually don't know what that process would look like. That's a bit of a strange process. I haven't really thought about that one. Um, but ultimately, what we're doing is we can kind of see how we move from something that's close to white noise to something that's, well, not close to white noise. And then the last question is, um, how do we pick P and Q when estimating an ARMA, or fitting, I should say, I mean, estimating the parameters, but when we fit, when fitting an ARMA PQ to our data. So how do we choose per, um, the order P and Q? Well, there's a couple ways. One is we could just use something called auto.arima in the forecast package, which does it for you. But then the question is, well, then how does that function pick the P and the Q? And we can say or arima in, I think that's just in the stats package, the default one in R. Um, and the, uh, the point is we can use AIC or BIC for model selection. And that's exactly what that um, auto arima does behind the scenes. It basically says, okay, I think it, I forget if it defaults to AIC or BIC, but whatever it defaults to, you can switch it to the other one and it'll say, aha, I'm just going to fit a whole bunch of ARIMA models until I find the one that minimizes the AIC or the BIC or whatever you give it. Um, and that's sort of, yeah, standard model selection type approach. You can do it manually using the ARIMA function in the stats package. You can fit a few models and then decide, well, which one has the smallest AIC or smallest BIC? That'll be my favorite. Um, depending on if you like AIC or BIC, um, even though very often they're probably going to give you the same answer, but not always. So you have to be a little careful. And you get to do that in your uh, next assignment that you should be working on um, and actually fit some, uh, a, um, some ARIMA models to some actual time series data. So that's pretty neat. All right, and we have one more thing that we're going to start discussing in today's lecture and finish it in the next lecture, and that's forecasting for the ARMA process. We'll start it today, talk about some of the basics, we'll finish it up in the next lecture, and then we'll just look at some R code for fun, for estimating and for forecasting ARIMA, ARMA and ARIMA processes. So moving on, we're going to talk about forecasting for ARMA PQ. Right, so 
what are we doing? Well, let's just write it down. I forgot to write down the model last time, but we'll write down the model right here, just so we have it in the front of our head and somewhere on the white, there, the OneNote page, so that I can point at it if I have to. So we're gonna ignore the I part, the integrated part. It's not gonna be an ARIMA model, it'll just be an ARMA model, but you can do a lot of these things for ARIMA models too. You just have to, um, well, account for the differencing. And we assume causal and invertible as always, basically. <laughs> So again, what we want to do is we want to predict, say, well, what we want is an H step ahead prediction. Very often we just do a one step ahead prediction, but okay, we can do H steps ahead. And uh, what that's going to look like is it's going to be some estimator x hat t plus h and it's really just going to be the expected value of well x ah i was using capital t because we're saying our data set goes all the way to capital t we want to predict h time units into the future what is it going to be well it's just going to be the expected value of that random variable conditioned on our entire data set. All right. Um, but there's going to be a little twist we do here, and that's it's mathematically nicer to condition on infinite data. Okay, so we actually get a different term, which is going to be x tilde t plus h. And this is going to be, well, the expected value of x t plus h conditioned on x capital T back to x1. But we're not going to stop there. We're going to include an x0 and an x minus 1 and go off to the infinite past. Now, that data does not exist in our data set. We only have the first, these um, T measurements, and we do not have any ones that go past that. What we're going to do is use X tilde to mathematically understand the forecasting or the, the, the estimator, the, um, the predictor, I should say, the H step ahead predictor, and then we're going to switch tilde to hat at the very end. So stick with me here. It's a uh, pretend now that, okay, we have access to lots of data. Um, and it's not completely terrible thing to think about because as T, the data size gets large, all of this stuff that I underlined in red becomes fairly negligible. And these two predictors become very close to each other. Um, so again, we don't have the ability in the real world to work with X tilde because we don't have infinite data, but we can mathematically try to understand it. And that's what we're going to do. So the next thing we need is we need to write out our process both as a causal and an invertible process. So this is kind of, I guess, step one is get these things. Step two is we need to write out the causal and invertible process. So causal, a causal linear process going back to one of the first lectures is going to be X T plus H is just going to be W T plus H plus an, in, or an infinite sum J from one to infinity of Psi J W capital T plus H minus J. And we're also going to have our invertible 
process. And in this case, we get not an X, but we have a WT plus H. And this will be a big sum of X's, XT plus H plus the sum J from one to infinity of pi, my new parameters, pi J, X capital T plus H minus J. <laughs> All right, so we have this. This is something that we did back in, I think, chapter one of the lecture notes, um, but it's good to write it down because we're gonna need these tools going forward. Mainly, we're going to apply this conditional expectation to these terms and see what happens. Um, so now, combining one and two, what we get, well, okay, we're almost at that point. Uh, first, note that the expected value of WT conditioned on capital or X capital T all the way to X zero and on to the infinite past. So this is again, infinite past. Well, this, we know what this is. This is either going to be WT itself. This is if little t is less than or equal to capital T or it's gonna be zero if little t is in the future. Um, okay, so why? Well, one, so why is this true? Well, for one point, if t is greater than t, if little t is greater than big t, as I like to say, the white noise lives in the future of our data, so it's, but um, it's basically, more mathematically, what we can say is that if this is true, then WT is independent. Yeah, I think we're still assuming Gaussian in this case. I guess, no, um, I'll say uncorrelated just to keep it as general. We don't actually, um, well, no, we're conditioning, so we do need independent. Yeah, so I guess we probably need to emphasize I don't think I did that, that in this case, we would need um, at least independent IID white noise. Of the past measurements, XT all the way into the past. Um, again, this is because the process is causal, which means that it only depends, the X's only depend on the current time and the past. WT lies in the future, it's independent of all of that stuff. Um, and then two, we say that um, if T is less than or equal to T, um, then we have a one, to one correspondence between the X's and the W's, i.e. conditioning on X T going into the past is kind of equivalent to conditioning. This is terrible notation, by the way, but I hope it makes the point. Uh, WT into the past, right? The XT is just a linear combination of XTs and WTs. So we can always just invert it somehow and say that if we know what every XT is from now into the infinite past, well, then we know what every WT is from now into the infinite past by just, I guess, reworking the equations. It's equivalent um, uh, conditioning. So we have that, um, oh, and, and then I will say similarly, what we have is that, so this is, I guess, one thing we need, and the next thing we need 
is going to be that the expected value of xt, um, x, yeah, little x little t, conditioned on the entire infinite past x capital T through zero and on to the past, well, it's going to be one of two things. If it's either just going to be itself, this is if T is less than or equal to capital T, and otherwise it's going to be X tilde, right? This is X tilde T if T is greater than capital T, right? Because that's exactly what we wrote down back in step one. We said, well, in this case, we're just replacing capital T plus H with little t, but it's the same thing. Okay, we have that. Therefore, our causal representation becomes what? Well, well, I should say applying this yeah, to the causal representation, what we end up with is, where was that causal representation? Ah, I just have just not quite enough room to fit it onto the same page, um, but that's okay. What we end up with is an X tilde T plus H is going to be the sum in this case j but we're not starting from zero we're starting from h and going to infinity of psi j w capital t plus h minus j okay so what happened there this is after taking the conditional expectation of each side. So let's look to make sure we know where that came from. Up here, my causal representation, I have an xt plus h. If I take the expected value of xt plus h conditioned on the data, I get an x tilde t plus h. On the right hand side, if I take a conditional expectation of each of these W's with respect to the data, I either get the W or I get a zero. So what happens is the first, I guess, H minus one, well, H from zero to H minus, or the indices from zero to H minus one of the W's all vanish because when I take the expected value, they become zero, they lie in the future of our data set, and the only thing that remains are the, um, the, the Ws and the Phis for J from H onward. This is why it's really convenient to be able to um, condition on the entire data in some infinite analog of our data set. All right, then, as we fight our way through this, remember what we're doing. We're trying to do prediction here. We're trying to understand what this predictor is. Um, so then we end up with the fact that X T plus H, the thing that we're trying to understand minus X tilde T plus H, the predictor of mathematical convenience. <laughs> um, if we subtract one from the other, we get a finite sum, and that is quite nice, actually. I like finite sums. J from zero to H minus one of phi J W T plus H minus J. And that means we can write down the mean squared prediction error. The mean squared prediction error or using that P notation that we were using in the last lecture and earlier in this lecture, if we want the mean squared prediction error for T plus H, given the data from T into the infinite past, again, we're still doing infinite past here because it's mathematically nicer. Well, that's just the expected value of this thing, X T plus H minus X tilde T plus H 
squared, i.e. it's this thing squared, um, and that's just going to be sigma squared, as is always out front, the sum j from zero to h minus one times the psi j squared. And it's a finite summation, so that's great. We don't even have to, I mean, it is causal, so we know that the infinite sum would have to converge, but we don't even have to worry about that in this case. All right, so that was the causal representation um, looking at the invertible representation. There was a reason why I wrote down both of them. Well, we can do the exact same thing, right? All I did up here was apply the conditional expectation to the causal representation. If I do the same thing for the invertible representation, what we find out is that we get a zero because I should just write it all out. The invertible rep representation is a WT, and let's go find it. Yeah, XT plus H and then a bunch of pies is equal to XT plus H plus the sum J from one to infinity of pi J X T capital T plus H minus J. So what happens is when I apply the conditional expectation here, to both sides of this equation. Well, I get a zero because um, I guess T, well, I shouldn't use T, capital T plus H lies in the future of the data um, set. And then I'm going to get my X tilde here when I take the conditional expectation of that term. And then we're gonna get two things out here. We're going to get a j from one to, I think it's h, yeah, h minus one, pi j x tilde t plus h minus j plus the sum j from h to infinity of pi j x t plus h minus j. So anything that lies has an index that's greater than capital T gets a tilde stuck on top of it. Otherwise, we just keep the series the same as before because we're conditioning on the data points that we are just looking at. <laughs> Therefore, what we have is that the, um, the predicted value x tilde t plus h depends on the data xt going into the infinite past and the previous h, um, is it h or h minus one? I think it's h minus one, yeah. h minus one predicted values. So what that means is that if we want to predict the H, H, I can't put a TH after H, just doesn't work. Um, if we want to predict the H time points into the future, we'd start by, well, predicting one, and then two, and then three, and then four, and then so on up to H, um, which makes sense because so often in time series we have things like autoregressive processes where the previous observations tell us what happens in the next case. Um, and that's what's happening here. All right. Yeah, we have a little bit more time. So what I'm going to talk about is we're just going to finish up our discussion on X tilde today, and we're going to leave the... Um, we're gonna leave figuring out how to turn X tilde into X hat for the next lecture, but we're not quite done yet because I want us to talk about the, what happens 
when we try to predict far into the future. I feel like I should go into like an audio editor and have like future, 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 but that would just be uh, silly. So we're not going to do it. Um, but it is an interesting point, right? In time series, we're often trying to predict future measurements. We want to know what the price of our stock's going to do. We want to know what the price of, or the price, what the number of COVID cases is going to do. We want to know what the global temperatures are going to do. Um, hopefully, they're not all going to go up, except for our stocks, of course. We want those to go up. But um, the other two, let's have them not go up. Um, but the thing is, how far ahead can we actually feasibly predict in a time series? Because time series are super noisy. Uh, so does it even make sense to predict that far into the future? Well, you can. And we can figure out mathematically what we'll get out. So um, yes, what we need to know is a couple things. Well, first of all, uh, what we have is we have our predictor, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write out X. I'm going to write out the causal one, which has fallen off the top of the page once again. J from H to infinity of psi J W T plus, not T, capital T capital T plus H minus J. So that's our causal representation um, where we know that the sum J from zero to infinity of the absolute value of the phi J has to be finite. This came up back in, I think, one of the first lectures where we talked about a causal linear process that the coefficients have to be absolutely summable. Okay. Um, but that's actually quite interesting because therefore, well, there's a couple things. We know that phi j has to go to zero as j goes to infinity. I mean, yeah, if it's summable, if it's absolutely summable, the terms, the coefficients, the things, the summands, I guess is the word I'm looking for, have to go to zero. But there's something else that's even more interesting, and that's the sum of j h to infinity of the absolute value of phi j has to go to zero as h goes to infinity. And this is what we call a tail sum. Right? If we only sum, if we start our summation at h instead of zero, well, it's going to be slightly smaller. As we push h to infinity, this thing also has to go to zero. Um, so what does that mean? Well, therefore, um, let's bring this guy down here. And what it tells us is that x hat t plus h is going to tend towards the mean mu as h goes to infinity. So as we predict further and further into the future, what are we predicting? We're predicting the mean. We're saying, I have a stationary process. It has mean mu. If I watch this process for you know years and years and years, what's the best prediction I have? It's, it's the mean, right? That's all we have to work with. Um, because it's kind of saying it could fluctuate up, it could fluctuate down. But on average, we know what it's going to be. Um, and. Yeah, I guess actually I should be more precise. This is convergence and probability. Um, we have that by showing that the variance, yeah, actually goes to zero. I wonder if you can show that it's almost sure convergence. That's just sort of mathematical um, fun. But um, yeah, that's always a harder thing. You always have to show that it actually converges, but in a fast enough way to become almost sure. But um, we don't really need that. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead and say that um, and the mean squared prediction error is P T T plus H 
and that's going to be sigma squared times the sum j from 0 to h minus 1 phi j squared. So what happens as we take h to infinity? Well, this just goes to the sum of, well, we're just going to sum the phi squareds from 0 to infinity. And I'm pretty sure we saw that earlier in the lecture. This is just kx at lag 0. It's the variance, the stationary variance, I guess, to be precise. So what does that mean? That means as we move far into the future, the best guess we have for prediction for our armor process is the mean. And what do we, what's the variance of our estimate? Well, it's just the variance of the process itself. Because as we move far into the future, our data that we've observed no longer has any direct relevance to for prediction. Um, again, this is for a stationary ARMA process. That means that we are assuming that there is no trend. If we have an increasing trend, we could still assume that that increasing trend will continue. Again, sadly for uh, maybe global temperatures. Um, but uh, if we have a stationary process, the mean, it's, the mean is constant. It's not increasing, nor is it decreasing. That's why it's always our best predictor. Um, it is what we would predict in the future. Um, also, I made a mistake here. This hat is supposed to be a tilde. I'm so used to just writing um, x hat and mu hat and everything because that's what we do in stats. But we're going to stop for today. But next time, what we need to do is we need to figure out, well, what happens if we don't have an infinite past for our data set, which is every data set we're ever going to look at, right? We need to... Um, at least to the best of my knowledge, there isn't any that goes infinitely into the past, though it would be quite interesting if there were one. Um, regardless, what we're going to try to do is figure out how to replace the x tilde with the x hat. The same thoughts process that went into understanding x tilde goes into x hat because, as I mentioned, for a large data set, they're basically the same thing because the, the piece that you're kind of throwing away the x0, the x minus 1, are not really going to have much influence. But we still have to see what happens mathematically, um, and we will do that. But we will do that in the next lecture. So see you then.